of this excellent editorial written by Dr. Diego Torres Rosoto and Roger Elby on um, case for routine electrophysiological evaluation of all tremors. So my disclosure is that I was trained by Dr. Torres Rosoto and I currently work under him as a faculty in the Division of Movement Disorders. And I've met Dr. Roger Elby a couple of times, but I don't have any ongoing relationships with him. Uh, this specific editorial is written in the context of orthostatic tremor, but I think what's being discussed here is about tremors in general far more than just orthostatic tremor. And this editorial is written in response to this paper cited on the top by uh, Anhar Hassan and Kevinas on a slow orthostatic tremor from Mayo Clinic um, who have published a lot on orthostatic tremor and had done very fundamental reporting on understanding of orthostatic tremor. My disclosure is also that I have been thoroughly involved in research in orthostatic tremor with Dr. Torres, uh, helping start his research as a fellow uh, seven, eight years ago, uh, and then stayed in touch throughout his projects, ongoing projects, uh, here at University of Nebraska Medical Center. So I will be talking uh, in this editorial more on my impressions and opinions, and I'll be jumping back and forth. And rather than providing, uh, providing a detailed review of the paper or the editorial itself, uh, so, you know, I would refer you to read the paper if that is a subject that interests you. But I think more interesting to me is this general idea of electrophysiology of a tremor. So orthostatic tremor, for people who are not familiar with it, is a rare syndrome, extremely rare syndrome, that uh, was recently described as late as in 1960s and consists of this sensation of unsteadiness when the patient stands, which gets better if the patient can touch something or hold something or if the patient starts walking. So this is one of the highly unusual thing is that the sense of instability or sense of fall that the patient has actually gets better when they start walking, which is completely opposite and paradoxical for all other balance problem where the balance is worse on, on walking, but the patient feel actually good when they're walking and, and they actually feel better walking faster, which is also highly unusual. So. That is what is very interesting about it. It is also very different than all other tremor syndromes in the sense that the current consensus criteria for di diagnosis of orthostatic tremor requires a presence of a fast tremor in the legs measured by electrophysiology. And it is a tremor which is really very fast and not very visible with the naked eye. And not only that, the whole point of debate in this editorial is this idea of this by convention or by original definitions, this frequency range that was assigned for the diagnosis of orthostatic tremor. So orthostatic tremor, uh, by definition, has a generalized high frequency of 13 to 18 hertz. This is extremely fast. This is the probably the fastest possible f uh, frequency based on the human physiology. So a human cannot have a frequency faster than 18 hertz. 18 hertz frequency of a tremor in the leg means that the leg is shaking 18 times every second. Well, typically the whole leg doesn't shake and it's more of a vibration that is going on in the muscles or on the surface of the, of the leg, which is picked up on EMG. So the muscles are vibrating at a frequency of 13 to 18 hertz, contracting that fast and that generally doesn't create enough of an amplitude or movement of the legs to be visible, and even if there is a visible component of the tremor, it's typically not the fast one. So you cannot see a fast frequency of 13 to 18 hertz on the legs. So with that background, it's also interesting to note that there is an occasional subharmonic peak, and harmonics are that if there are long-standing fast waves, then they create a, another wave on top of this fast wave, which is a slower wave, which is considered a subharmonic um, and it is typically seen at a half the frequency or even one third of the fundamental frequency. And it's a natural characteristic of any standing wave or any ongoing wave that they will have a subharmonic. And that is often picked up in orthostatic tremor. Now, the point I will keep coming back to in discussion is this 13 to 18 hertz range. Why 13 to 18? Who came up with that? And in the literature, there have been frequencies reported faster than 18, which is not addressed in this editorial. So a frequency all the way up to 20 hertz have been reported. And there are definitely tremor reported 
with frequencies less than 13 hertz, even 12 and 12 and a half hertz. So what do you do with those? What, are, what is a 12.5 hertz frequency tremor? Is it primary OT or is it not? And that's what is being debated here in this editorial because of this paper that was written up on this definition of a new syndrome, which is being called slow orthostatic tremor. So a slow orthostatic tremor has been defined as a frequency of a range of 8 to 12 hertz. And that is now too slow to be in the range of 13 to 18, which is the high range of orthostatic tremor. And they are saying that slow orthostatic tremor is a separate entity, but has an overlap with primary orthostatic tremor. And now that's what creating this debate on what does the frequency of a tremor mean? How reliable that are, that is in terms of a diagnosis? If it, if it is the main feature of the disease, if the main feature of the disease is the frequency itself, then a lot of our diagnoses that are being made clinically right now become less and less reliable. And a lot of diseases that we are just lumping together as a single disease, such as Parkinson's disease, central tremor, may actually be found out to be separate diseases or syndrome if we were to go by the frequency of the tremor that the patient have and say that that's the more essential feature of a disease rather than the clinical syndrome or the presentation and associated symptoms and so on and so forth. So that's what being debated here. Another point I want to point out here that I will come back to is the freak, is the tremor coherence analysis. Coherence. Coherence is this idea that the tremors are of same speed no matter where they are in the body so that they are coherent so that they may not be in phase. In phase tremor will be that if a peak happens in one side of the tremor, because you know tremor is an oscillation, there is uh, ups and downs on the tremor. So if if uh, um, uh, uh, in phase tremor will have peaks at the exact same time in different areas of the body, let's say two legs, while coherence doesn't require to be in phase, doesn't require to be in sync. A coherence basically says that the the peaks happen on their own times, but they are always have the same consistent difference between each other. So they are of the same exact speed. And that's another feature pointed out here that a bilateral EMG coherence in the legs is a unique feature of orthostatic tremor. It is not a characteristic that's seen in other tremors. So if you have a tremor in the leg of essential tremor, which is extremely rare, or Parkinson tremor, and you put EMGs on both of the legs, the tremors will vary in their difference between the two legs in a variable fashion so that they're not coherent, they're not come happening at the same time, um, you know, which creates interesting physiological debates on the origin of the tremor. So after pointing those two things out, uh, I'm going to go on and say that the, uh, the edi editors uh, writing this editorial are um, basically discussing why the authors thought that the slow OT and primary OT are similar but separate condition, and they talk about five patients reported in the original, in the slow OT paper, which were considered as slow OT, but they should not have because they actually exhibited classic high frequency primary OT with subharmonic, which was slow. So the slow OT was not the true tremor. It was a subharmonic of the true tremor, and true tremor was fast, and that's why they were actually primary OT and not slow OT at all. And the subharmonics in OT are important, as I mentioned earlier, because the low frequency of oscillations are the one, the subharmonics maybe, or the actual low frequencies are the one that are actually visible. So in my review of the literature, a third of the patients that have been reported so far, about 30% or 28%, actually have a visible report of, of of a visible tremor, of a leg shaking or a knee shaking. And our work earlier on, on digital enhancement of videos of patients have shown that the tremor really is hard to see unless it's amplified and you cannot really tell the patient is having a tremor in the leg but it, it, it is because that the the low pass filtering properties of skeletal muscles will cause less attenuation to those low pass tremors low low frequency tremors while this low pass filter will filter out any high frequency movement then that's the natural skeletal muscle properties uh, of the legs themselves they will just amplify the low frequency tremor and they will suppress a high frequency tremor uh, in terms of physical manifestation. Now, another interesting point noted here, which I want to bring up related to orthostatic tremor in this whole debate, is that a 13 to 16 hertz tremor in the leg can be seen. Now, they're not calling it tremor, they're calling it an EMG burst here, technically. 
that can be induced in a normal person who doesn't have tremor by creating something that threatens their balance. So by either having them lean backward on a platform or having them stimulated that induces a sense of movement. That's the vestibular galvanic stimulation. So they feel like they're falling. And when they feel like they're falling, that's when they have a fast tremor burst or fast EMG burst in the leg, which looks like the tremor in OT. Now, it's interesting to see that on EMG, the tremor analysis is very complicated. And that's something that's also not discussed in this editorial here, but is of interest to know that the, the tremor actually is a burst of EMG activity. So it's not a single EMG contraction. Uh, contraction. It's an EM, multiple EMG contractions that are happening so close together that they create a single movement. And that movement, a physical movement to one direction is what a tremor is and not the individual muscle contractions. Uh, so it, it's a visible manifestation. Now that EMG burst is typically very fast. EMG burst frequency may be 200 hertz or 250 hertz or 150 hertz. So the individual EMG spikes of the muscles are very small, very thin on the time scale, very, very quick and they're gone. And, and that's not what is the tremor. So what, what a tremor analysis does is that it first rectifies the EMG. So it converts all the EMG signal from positive and negative to one side to increase or beef up or bulk up those bursts into something that can be then outlined as packets. So then there is this transformation which puts kind of a cover. Think of it putting a cover on your car that now you can see the whole shape of the car although the details are missing and individual details may have been too confusing but once you put a cover on the car that's what a 3D representation in games or maps of a car is. It's as, as if there's been a cover put on a car but you, you don't see any individual details. And that's what the packaging of this EMG burst is like on a, a Fourier transform where you where you uh, uh, package in these bursts into multiple packages and then you measure the frequency of these packages and these packages frequencies actually it's not a single frequency it's not that someone is having a 16 hertz tremor they have only 16 hertz packages firing very uh, nicely and cleanly on that emg after Fourier transform no that's not the case you then plot these packaged bursts onto a frequency scale and you weigh them, you put weight on each frequency of how much power of or how many packets are you seeing at that frequency. So maybe you're seeing seven at two hertz, you may be seeing nine at four hertz, so on and so forth until you see 150 packages on 15 hertz. So what you get is this graph like like this, although this is not the graph, on, this is a graph for coherence, but in this graph you can see that there is these weightages of all these different spectras, the uh, weightages of all these packets of bursts of EMG at various frequencies until you reach a point which has a broad base and a sharp peak, that this peak is where the most of the EMG burst activity is centered at. But, you know, here it creates a debate. Now, is the frequency, the range of this base of this peak, which will go from 14 hertz to 16 hertz, rather than saying a 15 hertz tremor, is it a 14 to 16 hertz tremor and not a 15 hertz tremor? And that's an interesting question to ask. Because if you review papers on orthostatic tremor, you will see actually many papers report a range of the frequency and not the frequency itself. They don't give the peak because maybe the peak in itself is meaningless and it's the broad base of the range that matters. So let's say if someone says they have a 12 hertz tremor or 11 hertz tremor, is it a 11 hertz tremor or is it a 10 to 13 hertz tremor with a peak at 11 hertz? So the question is this range of 13 to 18 hertz, is this the range of the peak? And or is it is it that we should be looking at the range of the base of that peak, which is much broader, and some patients may have much more broader peak than others. So a peak may, uh, a base of this peak may be much narrower within half a hertz frequency for some patient, but it may be much broader, maybe two hertz or three hertz of a range of frequency some patients. So is it the base of that peak? 
that matters or is it the peak that matters? See, all these interesting debates that get that, that would come up if we start looking at the electrophysiology of tremor as the most significant component. Anyways, coming back to this editorial, they also talk about the absence of a well-designed multicentral trial that has defined this 13 to 18 hertz, and it was just a, conven a consensus that the committee or task force came up with based on their review of the literature and discussion and personal biases. So it may be a biased range, even for the peak. And what if the peak doesn't matter? It's the base that matters. And if, if, if you are going to define someone by their base, then how can you say that the 12 hertz is actually a slow OT and not a fast OT? Because the 12 hertz peak may have a base of 11 to 13 hertz. And maybe the peak was not in 13 hertz, but the base was because it's a broad peak, you know, and how broad is the peak? How broad of a peak can you tolerate? And we know of these patients in orthostatic tremor syndrome component where the frequency actually is hard to pin down. So what is that resolution that you can reach the peak based on this kind of a power spectral analysis of the EMG burst after four-year transformation? So are you getting a resolution of one hertz? So you can either tell a 12 hertz tremor or a 13 hertz tremor, but not in between. Or are you getting a 0.1 hertz resolution that you can tell it's a 12.6 hertz tremor or it's a 12.4 hertz tremor? Can you get a 0 0.01 hertz of a resolution? I don't think so. Not with the current technology or maybe not physiologically not possible. So you cannot say a patient has a 12.56 hertz tremor or 13.26 hertz tremor. And again, this may be meaningless because we are talking about peaks here and not the broad base of that spike that happens. And the broad base will be, you know, much more wider. So that resolution doesn't even matter. So if you, you can say the peak was 13.79 hertz, but it doesn't matter because the base was 11 to 15 hertz was a really broad base. And how sharp was the peak? Was the peak even sharp? So if you look at this graph here, you will see that the peak is actually not sharp. Even the peak itself is almost half a hertz or one hertz broad. So are you taking the center of the peak now, which is not a sharp peak anymore, as the frequency of this tremor? Maybe the frequency is the broad width of the, the apex. Maybe you actually never get a peak in some of these cases when you do this uh, Fourier transformation and, and analysis. I don't know. Maybe you can, maybe you don't. I don't think there's any data on that. So that then leads to this whole discussion on, okay, if tremor frequency is significant for orthostatic tremor, is it only significant for orthostatic tremor? Are we going to start splitting orthostatic tremor into groups like fast OT, slow OT, intermediate OT? Because of these peaks on this uh, Fourier transformation, or are we going to also do it for other diseases? So how about Parkinson's disease tremor? We can have a slow tremor Parkinson, a fast tremor Parkinson, intermediate tremor Parkinson, and so on and so forth. So it's a large Pandora box that can be opened. And then the edit editors also opened up an even bigger Pandora box without thinking about it, that they said that most smartphone contains motion transducers with inertial measurement. Now, motion transducer is now actually picking up the motion itself and not the electrophysiological frequencies, which means that they're not using the method used on EMG to create the peaks by using EMG bursts and then Fourier transformation to create packages out of it and then doing a power spectral analysis of those packages frequencies to see which packages are at what frequency. They, it's being bypassed all of that and now the motion being picked up and maybe there is a similar but a different mechanism being done by the motion transducers and the smartphone applications by putting this together to create a Fourier transformation, but not they are not getting EMG bursts anymore. They're looking at the physical motion, and we already know that there's a low-pass filtering being done by the skeletal muscle itself for those EMG bursts. So the low-frequency burst will get more weightage on motion because of that low-pass filtering as compared to high-frequency bursts, which will get less weightage because of the pass filtering. And then you will have a twisted result on the motion transducer. Maybe it's not a huge difference. Maybe let's say it's a difference of one hertz. So if an EMG picks up a 16.5 hertz tremor at a peak, 
then the motion transducer will pick up a 15.5 hertz tremor peak. But that one hertz difference will become significant at the borderline. If you're going to define a sharp border of 13 hertz as the border for orthostatic tremor from primary to slow OT or pseudo OT, then what if the tremor was 13 hertz on EMG but was picked up on motion transducers as 12 hertz? All of this is hypothetical debate because none of this information is available for us. So here's my take on this editorial and this concepts of electrophysiological analysis.